Thank you so much for being here. What a gorgeous gathering on a soccer occasion that we're going to do for us to make it beautiful and life giving. My name is Tanya Paperni, and I am really pleased to bring together a group of. If you have people that are watching the live stream and they're saying it's not working, please let us know. Hello, Facebook. Um, I'm so pleased to have brought together a group of incredible <laughs> Joshua Hoffman, ladies and gentlemen, incredibly volunteering on all of you tonight. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> um, so pleased and excited to have brought together a group of incredible artists, writers, musicians to build solidarity tonight, not only with Ukraine, but with so many people and peoples who have suffered under Russian imperialism, Russian terror, Russian greed and expansionism. I say this as a person uh, of immediate Russian descent. So we are multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-faith, multi-genre presenters who all are here in solidarity um, as yesterday was the one year anniversary of the full scale invasion and occupation of Ukraine by Russia. But it was not the beginning of this um, war. So let me give you some logistics and context before I get into the uh, heart and veins of it all. So um, where you're located right now is called Rhizome. It's an incredible, incredible, beautiful DIY volunteer run event space. Um, my host tonight is Leslie, who's right here. Thank you so much for having us again. This is a gorgeous space. There's almost no spaces left like this in the DC area that are total, truly DIY aut autonomous spaces that host a lot of beautiful, wonderful things. And um, the threat of eviction is looming um so follow them attend future events uh, they do a lot of cool experimental music um donate support etc any funds that you all donated uh in your pre-ticket registration anything that you donated at the door um, is going to fund our presenters all of whom came from out of town i mean paying artists uh, and a cut of that goes to rhizome because rhizome as i said is all volunteer run. So we really appreciate the donations that you've made in advance. I know that we've sold at least 40 tickets even in advance of today, um, several hundred dollars fundraised, so thank you so much. Later in the evening, we will also be fundraising for an organization, which is also totally DIY and autonomous, called U Ukraine Trust Chain. So I will be asking you for money again. Um, so that's Rhizome. We are here, the bathroom is upstairs, the Wi-Fi passwords on the fridge. There are three kinds of tea. There is chamomile. What is chamomile called in your languages? Mashka. The other. Babunyi. Babunish. Okay. Uh, so we have that chamomile, very common herbal tea in a lot of. Eastern Europe and maybe other places. Then we have linden tea, which in, in Russian is lipa. What do you, other people call linden? Nobody knows what it is. It's it's sweet, it's like chamomile. And then there's black tea. Uh, I'm sort of embarrassed to say that it's just like Twining's Girl Grey, but it's, Woo! you know, <laughs> British imperialism is a thing that we oppose as well, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so anyways, there's tea and there's a traditional samovar, which is a, a pot of hot water. So we've made the tea very strong, and so you are to dilute it with hot water as is tradition. We have baklava, which was donated by an amazing Palestinian family-owned restaurant just down the street called Palm Grill and Lounge. Um, what other logistics do I have to say? Um, there's an incredible exhibit upstairs that I encourage you. We'll take a brief break in the middle. You can check it out then. Check it out at the end. We won't kick you out if you want to hang around. 
we're hoping to start a fire outside um, afterwards if you want to chit chat. Um, live stream. And finally, sad to announce that Olga Livshin um, is not actually able to join us tonight. Um, she's the first person in the program, but she's incredible and I encourage you to check her out because just, if I'm not mistaken, today or yesterday, a uh, translation of a contemporary Ukrainian poet that she translated was published, um, Mila Kirsonskaya. So Olga's based outside of Philly, um, she's sad to miss us. We send her all the love if you're watching. Um, and you can tell your folks that it will be available, the recording will be available on Facebook after tonight as well. Okay. Any logistical questions before we move into feelings? Feelings. Um, I know it's a small space and you all can likely hear without a microphone, but for accessibility and for Facebook Live, we're going to use the microphone. So I want to just tell you a little bit about why we're here. So exactly one year ago, um, the Russian government initiated a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. But this war has been going on since 2014 um, with the Russian occupation of Crimea, which is a peninsula in the Black Sea. And what has been really important to me as a writer and person of Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish and Ashkenazi Jewish descent is to continue to uplift the stories of how multi-ethnic, multi-faith, multi-racial, multinational people are in the former Soviet Union and in places that Russia continues to occupy, invade, colonize, however you want to say it. So conflicts that may be less known to folks that Russia has been upholding the Assad regime in Syria since uh, the Syrian civil war, loves to support dictators, genocidal dictators. Um, there's a Soviet Afghan war in Afghanistan in the 70s and 80s. Um, there are ongoing conflicts in a region called Chechnya, uh, which was an autonomous republic after the Soviet Union collapsed and a lot of uh, racist and Islamophobic rhetoric is used to suppress independent movements in that region. Um, and what is happening, what we're seeing now that is affecting the, the loved ones of so many people in this room right now is, is the latest in that. And it, what we've been seeing in the past year is absolutely horrific. Um, it's, it's hard to even talk about as someone with, you know, personal and other connections to this, but I would love to just hold a moment right now for us to think about the ways in which the images and stories we've been seeing over the last year have seeped into our consciousness and maybe reminded us of horrors that have nothing to do with the war that we're seeing, but horrors that are close to our family history. And if we could just take a, a moment or two of silence to hold up what is the thing that, that brought you here tonight? Who are you honoring? Mom? What whose memory are you uplifting? Thank you. So in my world, resistance is art. Art is resistance. And part of what we've been seeing over the past year is the rebirth and resurgence of Ukrainian language and culture. Ukrainian language and culture at various times was suppressed or repressed in the Soviet Union. And a lot of, most Ukrainians are, are bilingual, many are bilingual. 
Um, but now is a moment of people really creating, creating language and culture. And I want to use that impulse to build bridges with other people in this room and elsewhere who, for whom practicing your culture, passing it on to your descendants, celebrating in community is a form of resistance. It's a form of resistance against erasure. It's a form of resistance against forced assimilation and displacement. So together tonight, we're going to be sharing our traditions and our stories and our beliefs and our um, other things. So I just want to call attention to this law behind me, which my, my grandmother sewed. Uh, and I've never used it. It's been sitting in a drawer for years. Um, but it's got like sort of Ukrainian folk tradition in it. And she um, was born in a Siberian prison because her mother, who was born in the Ukraine, um, was arrested by Tsarist police in the Russian Empire and sent to a Siberian prison. So the only reason my family ended up in what we now call Russia is because of Russian imperialism. So. It is very close to my heart. Um, so I'm going to move us along. I think we've, we've gotten the gist of the feelings. We're here to, you know, build solidarity across across borders. And let me just tell you a little bit about each of the people who are here today, because we're not going to be doing bios. Um, we have programs that have their bios in them. Each performer will, will share. You are welcome to applaud, uh, and then they will introduce the next performer. We'll have a brief break in the middle where I will be asking you for money. Um, and then we will have a interactive activity before we close. So um, first is going to be Rafi Wartanian. Wartanian. Um, Rafi is going to be sharing writing and acoustic music on the oud. Then we're going to hear from Matvey Yankinevich. Um, writer, poet, translator, editor, who's been responsible for bringing a lot of Eastern European poets into uh, English readers. Then we're going to have Oksana Marafioti, who's going to be sharing some from an in-progress memoir about identities and holding identities under repression and oppression. Then I'm going to ask you for money. Uh, then Julia Kolchinsky dasbach is going to be sharing, uh, incredible poet, um, who's also going to be helping tell us a little bit about the organization that we're fundraising for today. And finally, Abdul Rahman Nanse, calligrapher, um, has brought some of his work, some of which he will be giving away today, which is incredibly generous. But he will come up and tell us a little bit more about it, and it's available on the table there. That's the lineup. And I have one final piece of logistical homework for you or introduce Rafi. We're going to end with a collaborative poem today. If you know me, I will never let you leave without writing a collaborative poem. So your homework is, while we're here, if anything moves you, a word, a phrase, a sentence, write it down. With a pen, uh, on your phone. At the very end, we will do something with that. You will find out. Does everyone follow? Okay, wonderful. Rafi, our first presenter, please come on up and Josh on tech. Thank you. 
These are oud compositions. Uh, that first piece was inspired by the late uh, Yemeni oud player Ahmad al-Shaiba, who recently passed away. 
very young, but he had just put out an incredible album just this same year, and I'm really moved by it. So I, that that piece I displayed was in, was inspired by. And I I don't have a name yet for this piece, uh, so if you have any ideas, <laughs> let me know. And the same is true for the next piece I'm going to play. I don't have a name for it, but um, I've been composing oud music. I'm just trying to follow the music. This one's more like a like a blues and Armenian folk thing that was happening. So I'll play that, and then um, maybe I'll say a little more, read some poetry, and then move forward from there. Mm -hmm.
All right, thank you. Um, well, I was really excited when Tanya reached out because um, I think that obviously, of course, what what's happening in Ukraine is so hor is is so horrible, and it's like transcends words. Um, but also, as an Armenian, um, you know, people in Armenia and Armenian people around the world have been experiencing something similar, not the same, but something similar. And so, oh, sure, sorry, for the live stream. Yeah, Thank no you. problem. So, um, the experience of um, what's been happening in Armenia and Artsakh, a, a, an Armenian republic that's adjacent to and connected by land to the Republic of Armenia is, is being um, invaded and systematically, you know, destroyed by um, Azerbaijan's genocidal dictator. Um, and the, the twisted irony is that the peacekeeping force in the region is Russia. Um, of course, this is a very nominal uh, presence that they have, or it's peacekeeping um, so for, for myself as an Armenian person, seeing what's been happening in, in Ukraine has, um, made me just think a lot about, um, just trying to connect with, um, people out, outside of my own community and my own experience. So I was just really excited to try to. Um, and honestly grateful and honored to be able to be here as one of many Armenian people and voices, um, some of whom are in the room, incredible friends and artists and thinkers. Um, so thank you again to Tanya. And, um, and so I wanted to just read some poems, um, maybe one or two lighter things, uh, and then something a little different. Okay, the first poem is uh, something I wrote recently, and I was thinking a bit about how history repeats itself, and um, I think as Tanya was talking about her grandmother's experience, and, um, you know, just, of course, thinking about how history repeats itself, but time has been on my mind a lot, and I think since the pandemic started, this quote from Lenin has been circulating, where he said, there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen, Feel like we've been living in the, that second clause weeks where decades happen for years now um, so anyways I've just been thinking about time a lot so I wrote this poem it's called a theory of time I have a theory that time is circular cyclical Sun and moon seasons spinning leaves browning push and pull of waves shoring clock hands circling time is not linear Though timelines help us situate ourselves inside infinity, within cycles of progress before our births, progressing after our deaths, I cannot put a circle inside of a line, but a line can lay in the loving embrace of a circle. Uh, this next poem was kind of, uh, it's about elevators, but it's about more than and uh, I'd say my first real like thing with elevators was in Lebanon. We would go there in the summers to visit my family. We went there after the Armenian genocide. They went to Lebanon. And um, there was always this fear that the electricity is going to cut out. And so there was this thing about when you go in the elevator, you need to have a plan just in case the electricity cuts out. And there was always this story in my grandfather's building that one time someone was riding in the, in the elevator, the electricity cut out but they were like halfway between floors and they tried to get out and then the electricity came back on and then they lost a limb and so you better have a plan. Um, so, but elevators are, are more than that. So anyways, I was in, in an elevator recently and I, like at work I had to be on, I had to park on the roof and then I had to take the elevator down and the elevator had this smell that was like really beautiful to me. I was like really moved by the smell of the elevator which might sound like a strange thing to say, but um, it was the truth. 
So I wrote this poem about it. Doughy, warm, soft, flavorful metal, the scent of an elevator, the unexpected invitation to an aromatic steel coffin, approximating time travel, an oven where I enter and rise or fall, arriving somewhere different from where I started, new location, time morphs, transformations everlasting, even if I've gone nowhere, even if the elevator has stopped, even if I'm stuck, I'm stuck in the transformation that I may or may not be ready to accept. The scent of transcendence in Baltimore at the hospital where Baba worked, in Beirut where we entered with visions of severed limbs, in the parking structure, the seemingly meaningless ritual, a worker transmuted by a capsule of memory laced with the aromas of possibility. And the last poem is uh, called Rather Than Becoming. Basically, I was driving home from work. I, I'm from Baltimore. I live in Los Angeles now. I was driving home from work. It was very beautiful. The mountains, the sun, you know, and then I made the mistake of turning on the radio. And then I heard the news, you know, destruction, war, death, inflation, gun violence, the environment, all of it. So, so I just was like trying to, uh, I was thinking about the tension between the external beauty that I was looking at and then also just the like the horror of the world as it is today. So this poem is trying to sort of uh, understand that. Listen, they're about to kill us. They're coming for us. Have you heard the news? Look, it's their army, their drones, their barbarous rhetoric, their murderous weapons, their children writhing with hatred. Read their tired tomes distorting history, demonizing innocence, concocting justifications, warranting brutality. Here it never ends. Every day we're caught between the terror of existential annihilation and the exhaustion of shouting help, cries centuries old that we heard before we were born, as we age that we ourselves speak. We're silenced by these voices, deterred from expressing and blossoming into something lived, rather than becoming the fear of death itself, rather than becoming a resistance to erasure. We cannot become a celebration of life when we are locked in the grip of annihilation specter. All we can do is shout into the void, reach for hands crooked with carpool, balled into fists, tightened with anxious screws, threaded with money and isolation, and watching the world slowly crumble as the sun sets and casts a shadow, mountains dropping their coats onto sagebrush, bees nuzzle the purple lavender my grandmother planted, plumes of smoke spin through starlight, invade our lungs. We speak fire, we read fists, we hear petunia, the taste of her heartfelt quilt crack like light glistening, reflecting remains of silent mirrors. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next uh, presenter, Mate Yankelevich. Is it okay? This distance? Thank you, Tanya, for organizing this. And also, very honored to read at Rizo. And uh, it's the kind of place that keeps the flame lit. And I hope you all hang in there. We need you. Um, I'm going to read from a variety of things, mostly translations, and not all my own. So uh, there'll have to be a few 
historical prefaces. The first poem I'm going to read is a translation that I not um, that I worked on with um, my translation partner for this project, John Hai. Um, we've been working on the poems of Osip Mandelstam, the Russian language modernist, um, for many years. And this poem was written by Mandelstam when he was in exile in southern Russia in Voronezh, which is actually quite close to the border with Ukraine. Um, it is a poem which he remembers being in Kiev in 1918. Uh, he writes it in 1936 or seven, seven, 19, April 1937. Uh, you may notice a kind of uh, reference to Gogol, the Gogol coat. You may also, those of you who know Gogol, the Ukrainian writer. Um, um, You'll maybe know the horror story V, a very you know, 19th century Gothic horror tale based on Ukrainian folklore. Um, so that's mentioned. And also, it's important to imagine Kiev during the Civil War, when, you know, when it's being taken over you know, at one point by the whites, at another point by the reds, back and forth. Uh, and there are a few place names. They are all place names having to do with Kiev. There are also a few Ukrainian words in his Russian, but I will not attempt to point those out here <laughs> because here it's translated into English. Um, <clears throat> in the streets of V possessed Kiev back then, how someone's wife ran amok. As she searched for her man, not a tear tumbled down those warm cheeks of wax. No Roma girls tarot for powdered darlings. No fiddles play in the merchants' gardens. On Hishatik, the horses have fallen. Death's stench wafts from the, through the Lipki mansions. With the last of the outbound streetcars, the red soldiers were fleeing the city, and a rain dampened Gogol coat sputtered. Before long, we'll be back and forget it. It's a rather frightening poem, um, and Lipki is where he met his uh, wife to be in the Russian language from, is from Kiev. Um, which is the affluent neighborhood that was being ransacked first by the whites and by the reds and back and forth. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to a different writer, a very different writer, writing in also the Stalin era Leningrad um, in the late 30s. Um, I'm going to read from it was not published in that time, but um, the writer is getting the charms to the best of my translation. Do we know book number 10? There was a red-headed man who had no eyes or ears. He didn't have hair either, so he was called a redhead arbitrarily. He couldn't talk because he had no mouth. He didn't have a nose either. He didn't even have arms or legs. He had no stomach. He had no back, no spine. And he didn't have any insides at all. There was nothing. So we don't even know who we're talking about. We'd better not talk about him anymore. We know book number 10. A 
a certain Pantelier hit Yvonne with his heel, a certain Yvonne hit Natalia with a wheel, a certain Natalia hit Simone with a muscle, a certain Simone hit Sadafran with a wash basin, a certain City Fon hit Nikita with an overshirt, a certain Nikita hit Ramon with a board, a certain Ramon hit Tatiana with a shovel, a certain Tatiana hit Yelena with a pitcher, and a fight broke out. Yelena beat Tatiana with a fence, Tatiana beat Ramon with a mattress, Ramon beat Nikita with a suitcase, Nikita beat Salafon with a serving tray, Salafon beat Simone with his bare hands, Simone spat into Natalia's ears, Natalia hit Yvonne's fingers, Yvonne kicked Pantelier with his heel. Back, we thought, good people fighting each other. I'm going to move to Gennady Dwar, who is out here, uh, a slightly younger than Daniel Harnes, but who's from, who's a kind of admirer of Harnes and his um, small avant garde group that gathered in a place like this on the verge of marginality. Uh, and uh, during the, Lenin, well, the siege of Leningrad, it lasted, I think, 900 days, famously. Um, uh, he and a number of other people wrote poems. Uh, they were uh, some of them were collected back in the first school that in an edition called Written in the Dark, which I edited for a book up in the press several years ago. And you can find it if you like it. It's still in print. And Gennady Gore later, he lived through the siege and he uh, became a very famous Soviet statistician, later, actually. <clears throat> uh, this is a poem he wrote in like, 1942. With a shock wave in my ears, a cold mean in my soul, I am a shout to insanity. I am both check and mate to myself. I am mate, law I am nothing, and running toward nothing. Now I am no one's and rushing to no one. A shock wave in my mouth, a cold mean in my dark. A leg in my corner, an arm in my dish, the eyes that fell out of my sockets, a finger forgotten in one of the tunnels, an unneeded moon in the dark. That's the translation that I did with the Eucharistic Press for the Roman Catholic Church. I'm going to read from a book that just came out. Uh, this is from a Polish writer, or Polish language writer, I should say, Zuzana Dinchanka, who was born in Kiev, uh, Russian language family, Jewish, who fled Kiev in 1918. She was born in 1917. Um, to the then Poland, that was now Ukraine, to the East and then um, became uh, actually a very famous writer for a moment in her 20s. Um, and in 1936, I think her first book was published, um, moved to Warsaw, became kind of a big deal. She's a very, very young person and died, uh, unfortunately, very young in 1945 um, at the hands of the Gestapo. This book uh, was translated by Alex Wyslowski, and it is a book I just edited and published with a press called World Poetry, um, where I work. Um, what is this, one? this is called In the Battle for Birth, and it was written in 1941. When the battle is over and the shells of gold spool, we worship victory with white marble and epic. And here the battles are fought. The sudden dawn of spring, the space will show you burning as a glow. The space of beet fields shall show you. Let it be praised, flashing and thundering by your spring. Beneath the strong leaf, deeper juicy vegetables with sweetness swelling alive like your blood. And suddenly armor rattles, sharp armor cracks, the hard, greedy beetle crawls up and grubs, the pierced flesh shrivel 
us rest that we believe upon and steer the enemy direction of the problem. Where will relief come from? Quickly and cruelly let them strike at the enemy, no mercy in general. How much life the girls have in their angry eyes when they leave their festive swinging braids, gentle silver combs with soft down, bringing relief and future abundance to the fields. The bird's beak cuts like a bayonet, changes the battle's fate. It will preserve the braid and soft feathers and granite. May they be praised by the poem's passionate censor in years to come. Let a song tell of how he raised in the king's fields of verdant earth the coarse, rugged pathos in the days that made me. She's doing a lot of play. I hate to really suggest she's helping her. Four poems from Mirzy Fitzowski. Polish uh, writer who, in 1944, um, participated in the Warsaw Uprising, and later, after the war, became a chronicler of uh, Roma folk war and Yiddish folk war in Poland. It's very interesting to go through a Soviet period and complicated, and also he translated uh, Roma poets uh, and is very well, really well. Only known in this country as the guy who edited and discovered a lot of Bruno Schultz's texts and uh, wrote a biography of Bruno Schultz, which was commemorated by a Polish writer from the world living in Dragovich, which is where you know is in Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and also a guy for an Ukrainian war, too. Um, anyway, Fitzowski later wrote in this, I read a couple in the 60s and 70s. Tell how it was. Uh, these are translated by Jennifer Burris and Parker Sonner, not by me. Uh, but I, uh, and they're available in this book. Uh, it's called Everything I Don't Know. Tell how it was. So, yes, I took part. It was the war, and it wasn't. I came out of the camp and loused and free. So the stars above me. Were too many out of habit. I was to louse them in the sky. Once they multiply, good God won't feel them all. You'll have to fill the whole sky with. So they were saying about me, oh, he came out of the forest, but hell did not come out. It was the forest that went away. So boys, I'm standing, sorry, <clears throat> hey boys, I'm standing shod with axes. Standing still in the clearing, in the monotonous rhythm of a march. When was that? I'd have to ask Stasha, but he's dead. I don't want to bother him. So maybe I'm left with some pine that was cut and touched by fire, eaten by moths, and all of our guys not standing in the clearing. It's the forest that stands above them, 20 something years old. I don't want to remember, just like they can't. So do not ask what else and how I came out of wholesome and peace. Let's say an animal in my feet. That's it. There's nothing to talk about. Um, I'm going to read a poem of his uh, in memory of Janusz Korczak, who is well known uh, in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Throughout his work, but especially Poland, as a uh, writer for kids, children's writer, and uh, um, an educator. Uh, and he uh, ran an orphanage, he was the principal of an orphanage. Um, and when the Nazis came, he um, stayed with the kids, even though they were going to give him a pass because he was a famous writer. And he stayed with the kids, and the whole orphanage was taken to Treblinka. And this is called, again, this is Yerzy Chitsovsky, and again, the great translator to my friends Jennifer Burris and Peter Um This is called Five, uh, Five Weeks, 1942. So, what did the old 
Dr. Dean writings at Sri Lanka an account on the progress over a few hours of blood flow over the Delhi River of Trauma. What does that mean? What did the voluntary Sharon do, ferrying without an arm? Could he give the children the remains of his wounded friend and leave for himself only the shivers and the bones of the men? Did he lie to them, for instance, in small minimal doses, picking up the most sweaty heads, the skittish lice of fear? I don't know. But then, but later, but there in Sri Lanka, all the terror, all the tears were against him. No, it was only so many minutes that is a life. Is that a lot or a little? I wasn't there, I don't know. Suddenly, the old doctors saw the children becoming old like him. Older and older, they had to catch up to the grayness of the air. So when he was hit by an Askar or SS man, they saw how the doctor became a child like him, smaller and smaller, until he was not born. Since then, on together with the old doctor, there were plenty of them in the world. And one more poem from Kosovsky. I was unable to save a single life. I couldn't stop a single bullet. So I circle cemeteries that aren't there. I search for words that aren't there. I run to the aid I'm called for, to the rescue for aid. I want to get there on time, even if it's already over. I guess I, maybe I have a minute left, but I'm going to skip some of the poems. Might have done. I mean, but this was heavy enough. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe the, maybe I'll just read this one thing that I'm trying out uh, this one soon. I mean, I haven't been reading a lot of the fantasy editing books and translating um, things, but um, I was writing a little. So here, um, and I have some books over there, and if you're interested, you can read my books and I will come tell you about it. Um, and so I'll just read this one. Uh, it's something called No Home Home. Working title. To say my eyes are failing, say my sight is failing. To say I have no home. Say, I'm far from home. Say, it's a long way to go. Say, there's nowhere to go. Say, they say, go back where you came from. Say, they say, you don't have to go home, but you can't. Say, they say, go where your owls take you. Go on, they say, go. Yeah. To say, I have no home, say, my eyes are failing. To say war without end, say, me peace comes soon. To say there is no end to it, say, pray for it. They say it will never end. They say it's not my war. They say Whose side are you on? They say, make peace with it. Peace talks, they say, are on the table. To say, can't you hear me? Say, speak English. To say, what language do you speak? Say, can you come from beyond the hill? To say, anybody home? Say, whose home is this? To say, nobody's home. Say, war's home. To say, who's going to clean up this mess, Pushkin? Say, winter is coming. 
How do you spell winter? Over there, they spell winter with a D. Who's coming to dinner? Winter is coming to dinner. Thank you. Next up, Oksana Marafiuti. saying hello and thank you uh tanya and Raizo for putting this event together bringing us all of us here it's pretty incredible all right so i have a favor to ask um after i read this this short essay if you can relate in any way if you could just raise your hand that would be wonderful this is my experiment for my next book <laughs> um a little bit about myself um I, I wrote a memoir about 10 years ago called American Gypsy. I think you can purchase it for 15 cents on Amazon at this point. Um, although it's finally become a bestseller. Um, and it was about immigrating from the former Soviet Union in 1989 as a 15-year-old child of a very well-known um, performance, family of performers, and plunging into the American poverty right after. Um, and the second memoir that I'm working on now is about how um, most immigrants don't talk about a sense of fragmented identity uh, that can cause uh, prolonged intergenerational trauma. Um, so it's kind of my exploration of what it means and how to how do we find a way to heal ourselves. So this is called Borderlands. For those of you sitting close, you can see that I have notes because a writer's work never ends. <laughs> Edit without stop. All right. I am land. With age, features shift, the soil of me curves and rises and bears new formations. My entire life, I belong to every neighborhood I've ever lived in and to no country. I've been called a hybrid, a half breed, a bastard, and a cross breed. One word echoes with others, and all are true, and none are true enough. Writer Gloria Anzaldúria once said, quote, Borderlands are physically present wherever two or more cultures edge each other, where people of different races occupy the same territory, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy. I am Borderlands. A patchwork of cultures grows crops inside me. As most mixed people, I have become a resolute farmer. When someone asks about my ethnicity, I choose the shrewdest answer, a response that will prompt the other to smile and get human. I want to read a face that won't hurt or ridicule me for moments. I want validation, connection. As we are different people occupying the territory of a single body, gauging the safest answer is an art form only we crossbreeds truly know. If the asker is Azerbaijanian, for example, I'll be cautious not to say I'm Armenian. Our bloody history is just that history to me, but in self-preservation, I'll say I'm Ukrainian instead, a natural alter alternative, even if my fear is unfounded, even if the asker is full of empathy. In the company of a Ukrainian, I can never admit to that tiny spark of Russian blood from Anna, the great grandmother on my father's side. At least not now, when another word tears the lifelines into scraps. The graceful, slender lady who gave me a handful of her jeans must hide. With a Russian, it's a crapshoot. If they hear my maiden name, Kapulenka, they'll know immediately that I'm tainted with Ukrainian blood. Never mind that my Ukrainian grandfather and his Romani band entertained Soviet soldiers on the front lines and sometimes carried messages between parties of camps during World War II. Never mind that the Nazis broke his nose, his ribs, his legs, killed his brother. My Ukrainian last name is a dishonorable discharge. 
Rurik, the Varangian prince who sailed down from Scandinavia in 1862, colonizing the land between the Baltic and the Black Seas, would have something to say about this aversion. When he established Kiev and Rus, he didn't discriminate between the northern and the southern slaves. All were devoured in equal measure. Unfortunately, he's long dead, like the rest of us parsing out the land even now, land that will bury us all one day, turn us into weeds. Who's more authentic, a Russian or a Ukrainian? Sit them down and let them sing the tales of their grandparents' valiant acts during World War II, but just two generations later they ask, who deserves to live? Whose children should run down the fields without detonating explosives? The two factions will have to fight it out, they think. But in my borderlands, the Russian and the Ukrainian have long accepted that they're braided into my DNA, drawn into my identity with atoms. In the Russian and Ukrainian company, mixed or not, friends or strangers, I must decide how to present the Armenian in me. If I must, and I often must, they never accept my presence without questions. They squint the slant, body language, and inquiry of my ethnic denomination. What's your value in our company? Their body demands to know. Between their inquiry and my answer, I divine their response based on countless others. All those Armenian men that I might explain, exclaim, always running after our women, never working a decent day, good for little stupid, those Armenians with their simple women, never working a decent day. At a party a few years back, after learning of my Armenian ancestry, a friend remarked that I must think the crystal champagne glass is fancy, since I most probably drink champagne from paper cups. Never mind that Armenia is one of the oldest countries in the world, and at its height stretched between the Caspian Black and Mediterranean Seas. History is irrelevant. Dignity conditional. To leverage my worth, I add that I am Greek Armenian. See how I place. See how I place the Greek first. Well, that produces a collective nod of respect. Plato, Socrates, George Michael. He does not love the Greek. In the presence of a real Greek, my Greek self is diluted so much that they will comment only on my features and only in passing. Language gives body to an identity, and since I don't speak Greek. I am a disembodied Greek at best. I can only ever be one in a sense, by implication. My features are the only place they see a ghost of belonging. During World War I, survivors of the ongoing Greek genocide flooded the Armenian highlands. Soon, the land was strewn with Greek villages. That's where my own Greek story begins. In 1917, while fleeing a band of Ottoman soldiers with her family, my great-grandmother Angeli made a heartbreaking decision. They'd been traveling south for days, rickety wagons bumping down on familiar country roads, when a word reached from those following miles back that the soldiers were gaining. In desperation, Angeli, who'd been breastfeeding her youngest, jumped off the wagon, rushed to a clump of trees, and hid the baby, my grandpa, Nancy, in the, in the tall grass, praying that at least he would escape impending death. The next day, miles later, a distant relative caught up with Angeli's wagon and handed her the baby. The deed is why I am alive. The family settled in a village named Hankalon, where generations of Greeks would become known as Greek Armenians. The Greek in me belongs to that story and to that family of farmers. In her essay titled Corpus Cartography, Emma Pratchett defines diasporic identity as, quote, the disjunction between the dislocation of identity and the unstable territories of origins. Neither here nor there, and yet in several cultures at once. I'm constantly adjusting, negotiating how intimate the space within me grows. I'm sometimes disjointed and at other times fused with the identities I hold. A map of my ancestry is imprinted on my bones. Shapes form in my internal borderlands. Gloria Anzaldúa says that borderlands produce people she calls mestiza, mixed people suspended between cultures, fully accepting and fully accepted by me. 
I wish that sentence had a kinder resolution, fully accepting and fully accepted by all. What happens when a mixed person wants to accept themselves? What happens when a mixed person starts by accepting the language that she speaks? When identity is a kaleidoscope full of colored glass contained within the food. There's something in my blood that maps the languages I walk in search of acceptance. In Russian, I know resilience in the people who saved me from death more than once. In Ukrainian, I hear my grandma say to my grandpa, I would give anything for a pot of beer borscht right now, before they step onto the stage holding hands. In Armenian, I am a sister to every stranger in need. Hey, John. And my bumpy childhood cradled in the warmth of the Armenian highlands is rescued. I'm not done yet, but I'm trying not to like. <laughs> in Romani, my heart is never too far from my family's news of itself. I've never planned a reading. <laughs> I think I'm going to stop here. Sorry. <laughs> No apologies needed. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Five minute break. For real, five minutes. Bathrooms are upstairs, and when you come back, we're going to ask for your money. Can we raise our hands for our comments? Oh, yes. <laughs> do you need to do a tally? No, I'm good. <laughs> it was a solid half. Okay, thank you. Um, so for this portion of the evening, we're going to do some projector stuff. So live screen folks, let us know if you have issues. I would like to invite to the stage the talented Julia Polchinski dasbach to help let us know about Ukraine Trust Chain, who is very similar in ethos to Rhizome, and that's who we're fundraising for today. Welcome, Julia. Thank you all so much for being here and for creating this um, incredible space. So um, when bombs started to fall in Kiev on February 24th, about a year ago today, a lot in the Ukrainian diaspora uh, felt like we wanted to do something. And yet, what could we do? So poets got together and had giant poetry reading, musicians played music, and a lot of brilliant nonprofit folks did things to help people in Ukraine. Um, they started an organization called Ukraine Trust Chain, all run by immigrants from various parts of Ukraine. And they work with volunteers in Ukraine, volunteer organizations that go to regions that are hard to reach and provide food, medical supplies, toys for kids, snacks. So any funds that you donate today are going to go directly to people in Ukraine. Um, unlike larger organizations that do amazing work, like UNICEF, the World Aid Kitchen, they often can't get to these smaller parts. Um, so we're going to play a video, yes, um, and then you can learn a little bit about Ukraine Trust Chain. And on your programs, there's a little QR code. It's so easy. You just click. And then you donate. So it's a great time while you're watching a video to utilize that QR code. Right now. <laughs>
So now we're going to turn to some more poetry. For war and water. Everyone is having boys, my mother says. That means war is coming, the way it came in the old country. Boys rising out of the ice and cold potato fields. Boys laying bricks and digging wells and trenches and bodies. Boys out of other boys, like my boy, born the year before. Cops killed even more black boys, and boys killed other boys for loving boys. And more swastikas showed up on walls. And more walls went up where once ran rivers. But a river is not a wall. A river can either run dry or bloom. And everyone will blame someone, Gatlin, or an enemy, the gorilla who stole a little boy, or the gator who dragged away and wither. But in the water, they seem so strong, resilient even, these boys who beat the water down, who beat it with their tiny fists and kick as go, no running. These boys who go, not knowing they were born for war, and that it's everywhere, and there is no outrunning. So that book is from, or that poem, sorry, um, is from my first book, The Many Names for Mother. And it's a sentiment that I keep feeling again and again, the way that my children are inscribed, not only in an ancestry of intergenerational trauma, but in the constant attack on identities, on bodies, on humans that keep going on. Um, I immigrated from Dnipro, Ukraine in 1993 when I was six years old. My family came as Jewish refugees. Because, as some of you might know, in the former Soviet Union, you weren't uh, Ukrainian or Russian uh, if you were Jewish. You were Jewish. That nationality was marked on your passport. And with that identity, many privileges were taken away. Um, so I'm going to read you some more recent poems now, um, because I've been writing in response and in conversation with what's happening in my birthplace. Um, since 2014, when the war really started. Um, but these are some very recent poems within the last year. Um, some as recent as a few weeks ago. I do not mention the war in my birthplace, but somehow my son's body knows. My face in his hands before bed, he asks, if I cut you in half, will you be even? I am silent, expecting mothers in Mariupol are cut by invisible hands, children cut off from water. Because you have two eyes, plus two ears, plus two cheeks, plus so much hair, he says, plus your mouth can have two halves. So you would be even, right? He wants simple math, breath that outlasts violence. You divided by two equals to even use. He isn't asking anymore. He's making me monument. You would still be if I cut you in half. Small hands demand a splitting. If you cut me in half, I tell him, I'd be dead. Um, so this poem was written, um, this next one, exactly a year ago. Um, I live currently in Arkansas, even though I grew up in the DC metro area in Wasco Hills when my family immigrated. And um, as a Jewish immigrant from Ukraine, I am a Russian speaker. That is my mother tongue. I do not speak Ukrainian, um, even though I can understand parts of it. And um, this poem also is in conversation with a show that some of you may have watched before. And if you haven't, it's available on Netflix in English. It's called Masha Imidvid, or Masha Eber. Highly recommend. <clears throat> Watching Masha Imidvid as Russia invades Ukraine. Mishka, no Mishka, blares in Russian through one ear as CNN coverage of the first day missiles falling on my birthplace echoes through a blue earbud in the other. My children are on the couch drinking their morning milk 
and stuffing their mouths full of warm croissants, watching a blonde Slavic girl wrap a giant bear around her finger. Mishka, she tenderly calls, little bear, and he reluctantly does whatever is asked, prepares elaborate meals of kashas with dried fruits and homemade cherry, gooseberry, currant preserves and stroganoffs and stews and smoked fish with five kinds of potatoes. And if she but whispers in her small, high-pitched voice, Mishka, he will carry her in a menagerie of animals in his big bear arms across a swamp and field of wildflowers to safety. More missiles fall from Kiev. The airport in the city I was born is bombed. I don't remember it, my Dnipro the home where I collected chestnuts by the Dnieper River, or ate small spears of ice cream from a shop called Gilgvin, or held my mother's hand when the streets flooded and she lifted me up to walk the rim of rusted fountains. Incoming call from Dom, meaning home, interrupts the news. Mama tells me she finally reached her childhood friend. They spoke as shells fell, and maybe Marina could see fires through her window. My mother never thought this would happen. None of us did. The subway stations turned bomb shelters the way they were in the war her parents lived through and grandparents died fighting. Not while there are those still alive who remember, she said. How could he do this while they are still alive? She repeats it to her mother over tea and tears and disbelief. They thought they'd never have to endure it again. Ice falls in Arkansas, and my children demand another snack, an episode of Russia, in their mother's tongue, my mother tongue, this mouthful of history we chew and chew until it chokes us. Um, so this next poem is um, called On the Hundredth Day of War in My Birthplace. The rhododendrons keep blooming despite the blood. I don't dream or touch my husband. The toilet's been collecting a black rim at water level, no matter how often I scrub. My son refuses to sit until it's gone. My hands smell like my great-grandmother's last years in this country, though her childhood in Bila Tserkva must have smelled similar, ammonia mixed with goat milk and wheat before famine took one, or lilac and spilled oil when she'd steal away to the city, before war took the city. My children scream as though they know what's happening. I ask they use inside voices, the mashnikulas, whole voice. There's no direct translation. My tongue hurts in my mouth. I don't eat or clean my body. I claw at my scalp to find unintended gifts my children left behind. Lime Play-Doh, loss, and uneaten French fry. Their bodies use mine as treasure chest and waste bin. I stopped listening to the news in the car since Breaking active shooter inside an elementary school echoed on the way to my son's therapy appointment. I blast 90s pop off instead. You're a god and I am not. And I just thought that you would know. Recalling how my son asked why people go to church when he saw 21 chairs with 21 sunflower wreaths outside. To pray to God, I explained. Why, he said, God doesn't exist. Some people believe and it helps them, I clarified. And he asked, do you? Reminding me the chairs and wreaths mean someone died, or many someones. Dead, he repeated. Churches mean dead. Sometimes I believe, I said. Other times I spend 575 on a latte and count the Ukrainian flags I pass on Crouchwood, Longwood, Brentwood, Kenwood. It's been weeks since my last donation and I've stopped counting our dead. 
Do you speak Russian? My son asks every stranger. No, why? I do. My mom's from Ukraine. They always say how sorry they are for my country, as though they were the ones at fault, and maybe we are all to blame. The checkout clerk at the Kroger has cotton in her ears, the way I was forced to as a child, soaked in eucalyptus or iodine to prevent ear infections. Her name tag says Marina, and when she hears me speaking to my daughter, a familiar language, she says, I'm afraid to ask where you are from. She exhales relief, tells me her mother is in an occupied territory. It's been 85 days since they've spoken. She rings up our ice cream and hopes I'll come back. The vanilla melts on the way home and the children throw fits and want more sprinkles, longing for solid to stay solid. Sitting on the closed toilet lid, hiding from their screams, I am still born in a country named Outskirt, a city named River, on a street named Goddess of the Hunt, born in a government-assigned apartment where her balcony was my preferred place to sleep, while my papa sang inappropriate songs about alcoholics treating their dogs better than their women. And a neighborhood baba would shout out from the courtyard, he's ruining the child with that language. Now I sing my children to sleep in that same mother tongue in their American-born beds. I hear my son's echo. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. I tuck my children in and pray wordless. Poor my sunflower, my son whispers in English, tugging at my hair with petals and wishing, don't die, don't die. Even if he doesn't believe, he reaches not for God, but whatever language is closest to Mama. Um, so I'm going to do, oh, I'll do two more. Um, I'm going to do one that I just wrote. <laughs> um, it's a villanelle for the poet lovers in the room, which is a really strict poetic form. And I hardly ever write in rhyme. And I wrote this and I said to my mom, who may be watching, she was going to be here today, but she could babysitting the kids. Um, I said, I wrote a rhyming poem. You're really going to like it because the Russian language tradition of poetry often really rhyme. So it's called One Year Later. It's easy to look away from war when your wallet's empty and sink is full when the land and people aren't yours, when your children scream for more of you, when your body's pulled, it's easy to look away from war. The soil across the water to Earth's core brims blood, but look, the sunflowers still bloom when the land and people aren't yours. So be focused on the daily chores, dig out the trench of laundry, linens, wolves. It's easy to look away from war, with the dog barking, mailman at the door. Your children speak a stranger's tongue at school. The land and people aren't yours. How does a house become a shore no news can reach? Are we that cruel? Or is it just that easy to look away from war when the land and people aren't yours? Um, and then I'm going to end with maybe an uplifting poem. Maybe. It's, it's not really uplifting, but I'm going to try. Um, so, for the speakers of other languages in the room, sometimes it's really hard to translate jokes because, you know, they don't land as well. And I'm not very funny in poetry, but in life, I really like to think I'm a hoot. So I tried to write the <laughs> My friends were like, you're a hoot. Um, so I tried to write a poem where I was funny, and the only way I could do that was by translating a joke. So this is called, Jokes Don't Translate Well from Russian. It goes something like this. There was once an alcoholic, because it always starts with drinking, and a wife, because every husband must come with one. And she, of course, wants him to quit, and wears robes and makes tea constantly, serving sweets and preserves and sour cream, always sour cream. 
my mother tells me, over wine and tea and sweets and yes, sour cream. Because coming from Ukraine, it is even more certain and the preserves are always cheery. But back to this woman. Her friend advises her to fill a bathtub to the brim with vodka and then throw in a dead cat. He'll be so disgusted, she says, he'll never drink again. My mother finishes her weight. The red gives her an upset stomach or headaches now or some other pain, sobering one she's discovered in America. Then she tells the unworthy boy I brought home, my husband, years of drinking with me, that the secret to keeping a woman happy is to always keep her glass full. And so he does this. And the wife, too, does as she's told, then leaves the house. How easy it must have been to find dead cats back there and then. When she comes home, everything is quiet. No stumbling or snoring, no bottles or bottles on the floor. She goes into the kitchen. My mother holds her breath. Then I jump in to clarify that bathtubs were often in kitchens. Ours would be transformed into a makeshift table when covered by a wooden board. And of course, used for cutting potatoes or kalbaska or onions or anything boiled or pickled, soon to be doused with mayonnaise or, yes, sour cream. But the wife sees that the bathtub is empty and her husband is holding the dead cat, wringing it out and whispering, no kiska, no isho, chut chut. This part doesn't sound as good in English. Pussy, a few more drops. No kitty, a little more is better. My mother takes the empty bottle and wraps her fingers around the glass, mimicking the ringing motions. This, she says, is how we squeeze everything to the last drop. The dead are no exception. Thank you. Thank you. And next, it is my honor to introduce Abdul Rahman Nasama. Tried. I hope I got it close. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Abdul Rahman Naan. I'm a artist using a different technique. Your the microphone one? Yeah. Can you get closer to it? Yeah. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I'm using Arabic Arabic calligraphy. I think it's popular in the Philippines, but it's uh, everyone have a. I think everyone have uh, this idea about the calligraphy. It's all the art, and just uh, the artists, the calligraphers, they use this uh, art for presenting a uh, uh, religious. Uh, ideas or something you know but i started in the last five six years to present more ideas more uh, to be more free uh, with uh, with my ideas and create a new point a new way of presenting and bringing this uh, art and uh, this shape to, to present the, the feeling uh, the, uh, how, how we should be, live we should think our right to it. And uh, I use the, 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 the words I wrote you know, uh, or the, the, the phrases. I use the uh, Arabic poem. Sometimes the old Arabic poem, but not too many. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the thing I like to use, the phrases, uh, uh, from the Arabic haiku. Uh, if you know the haiku from Japanese, Japanese poem, the chapters, but there is a group, uh, big group around the world. It's, uh, they are uh, Arabic poets. They um, they create a new uh, 
way of uh, uh, writing uh, a poem by like the similar of I think. And I use one uh, uh, one uh, phrase uh, written by Ammar Hamoudi, who's a Syrian uh, poet, and um, uh, said uh, that that phrase they expand they expanded the prison yard till we couldn't see the wall, and this phrase gave me. So much, you know, so much thing to, to think about it, and I made it so many times. I made, you know, it's like a mount of artwork, and I put it in, in my uh, show in Arlington in the last years. And I made when uh, I I made a new a new one by the same. Uh, can I Thought about so much thing, but I'm not that person of a, a, a good way of speech. And uh, but I know, and I I know so much about this because the connection between Syria and Russia, the long history. It's we have the eleven years of civil war and. Started as a revolution, but they made it a, a, a civil war. Then Russia, like, yeah, let's support some, you know, they know each other, they support each other. And that's all the time, every day, give me this uh, energy of there's a people there, my family there, and I'm trying to do something. Yeah, by well, Thank you. enough for everyone so let's say one per household or one per bubble or molecule <laughs> okay oh this is so good this was so beautiful thank you so much um thank you Rafi. thank you Matve. consensus is your original poem is incredible there's oksana we can't re wait to read your second memoir Julia, as always, gorgeous work, the new stuff, love it. Uh, I love also when people memorize their work. It's good. Uh, and Abu Rahman, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're glad you're in the U.S. and that you came here and, and donated these gorgeous pieces. Um, thank you all for donating to our presenters and to Ukraine Trust Chain. Ukraine Trust Chain is amazing because they have no overhead. So I think that's a really just amazing accountability method. Um, so now uh, you are turning in your homework. It is ungraded. So I would like to thank the talented Tamim Thrupter, if she's watching, and the talented Seema Reza, one of the incredible writers who taught me this uh, activity. So what we're gonna do is as you are so moved, you will speak aloud the phrase that you wrote down, one at a time. I encourage you to stand if you are able and to speak loudly because we have people uh, watching. And we will just do it popcorn style as you are so moved. If you wanna share multiple lines, please feel free to do so, but do one at a time. And if there's awkward pauses, deal with it. Sit with it. Fill, fill the space with your words. 
So I'm going to start just to clear the air, and then I encourage anyone to join. Oh, wait, I can't start. I left my phone over there. Oh, I'm going to start. I know what I'm going to say. Five kinds of potatoes. Where our winter begins with a Z. Older and older, they have to catch up to the green and the patch. A cold breeze between my hands. In the sea and tears in the sea. I sing my children to sleep in that same mother tongue. Please talk to on the table. The space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy. Why is it centuries old that we heard the poem in the body? of an art group that gathered in a place like this on the edge of marginality. Whose children should run down fields without detonating explosives? <laughs> For the live stream, that was sour cream. Who thought an elevator? He wants simple math, breath that outlasts violence. They expand in the prison yard until we can't see the wall. Things will knit that will bury us all someday, turn us into weeds. Thank you so much. Holy cow, I have chills. I'm going to do some thank yous, so please uh, humor me. Um, my great grandmother thanks you. My grandmother thanks you. They're both dead, um, but I believe that we heal our ancestors, so thank you. I want to thank Bid Thompson for helping me write the language for this event. I want to thank Dee Cerebo, who's on live stream, for helping promote. I want to thank Elaine Tarnani Vaughn, who had to leave for setting up the tea. I want to thank my brother, Mark Kompanietz, who painted the image on the flyer. I want to thank Leslie with Rhizome and all other Rhizome volunteers for hosting us, setting up everything, facilitating meaningful gatherings like this. I want to thank Josh for volunteering to do all the tech and AB. Um, I want to thank my coven, who's on the live stream, for holding me down. I want to thank my gapers, who kept me alive the last three years. And more than anyone, I want to thank our incredible, incredible lineup tonight. Truly, I am, like, 
trembling and have chills with just your gorgeousness. So please, let's give them another round of applause. Please. You all wrote a gorgeous dagger and column just now. That was incredible. Um, so your homework is to go buy some books and art, or take free art, I guess. Um, learn more about folks. Tell other folks about Ukraine Trust Chain. The live stream will be available on Facebook until some billionaire buys Facebook and it doesn't exist anymore. Um, eat, drink, and thank you so much. Can we give Tanya a round of applause? Thank <laughs> you.